We have a boatload of items to cover on this week's episode of the USFL podcast, including new team colors, two hubs, tons of information on your favorite teams and where they are going to play. So stick around as me and James Larson this week are going to be giving you all you need to know on more of season two of the USFL in this edition, episode 44 of the USFL podcast. And it starts right now. One, two, three. Welcome, everybody, into the latest edition of the USFL Podcast. I am Zach Common in here sitting in the hosting chair this week alongside with not the ref. We, uh, as you can tell, the ref has been quite busy this week. He had a few live streams he was doing. Uh, he's uh, also taking a bit of vacation. Guy needs a break. If you if you ever, ever met him, dude does quite a bit on the side besides just this show. So I'm bringing in, of course, someone that you may be familiar with in the newsroom, at least newsroom ecosystem. He's a contributor. He's an insider for USFL Newsroom and does the XFL Newsroom, pro football newsroom in general. It is James Larson joining me as well. Also, photographer extraordinaire, by the way. A lot of beautiful photos he took at that USFL championship last season. He's going to have plenty more, I bet, on his slate. Uh, James, hey, good to have you on, man. Uh, Thank you for the you, kind words. Yeah, Thank you as for having you pointed me on. out, uh, you pointed out coming into the show, um, you don't, you've already done a fill-in episode with the ref before. Now you get one with me. It's, it's perfect. Different. It's a little different. It's just how it's supposed to be. I, 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 I tend to, I try to match his energy. It is hard to do, and in, in a good way. It's hard to do, but I will bring what I can to give you a good show, and you have plenty of stuff for me. As I will tease, of course, a little later. You were uh, at one of those hub announcements one of those press might have events been. so we're going to be getting into all of that here and so much more guys um like i said if you followed any of those live streams this week uh you know that we have plenty that we are giving a recap and reaction to um and if you haven't done this by the way you should probably check out and uh go and subscribe or follow to some of our sources that we have in terms of keeping up with the USFL via the USFL podcast. As if you're looking out for us on social, by the way, at USFL podcast, that also includes our YouTube channel as well at USFL podcast. If you're searching that up and if you're on the YouTube channel right now, well, Hey, have you subscribed by the way? Look, there's that big red button right below here. If you really like this stuff, if you really like this content, we're doing way more as the season goes on. This isn't just about the hub news. This isn't just about the change in color palette for a said team. If you haven't figured it out by now, I'm still teasing it. You want to stay with us. So be sure to hit that big red button. And as the man himself says, click the bell. It builds morale. You're going to feel good about it. We're going to feel good about it. You get to stay with one of the, if not the premier source of USFL news and coverage on the internet itself. And man, I have just been waiting to get into more of this. Also, by the way, if you're wanting that some of that new merch, it probably will be showing up on this site pretty soon. Breaking Tea, you know, they are one of the official uh, retail partners of the USFL. And we have a little bit of a discount code if you want to get you some gear. 10% off with coupon code USFL Newsroom when you go and visit Breaking Tea. And that's good for USFL gear. You can get XFL gear on there. You can get, you know, any type of stuff you want. There's way more sports on it besides alt leagues. Go to breakingtea.com. You know, get yourself some nice swag, 10% off, and you support the show as well as part of USFL Newsroom along with it. And yeah, I think that about covers it here. Uh, the ref did also wanted to say, shout out, it's been five years of the newsroom uh, ecosystem of websites. Started way back in 2018. Props to you, good sir. As That deserves a standing ovation, it honestly. Does. <laughs> it does. I am, I am very glad we are on this website getting to, you know, express and enjoy and get some coverage of these amazing leagues and in, in particular the usfl like i said this, this past year for you and i along with the ref pretty crazy stuff a lot of stuff we were given access to i appreciate what the league's done for us in that one year absolutely and in terms of newsroom he <laughs> i gotta give props stefan i wish i was on the show just for the sake of for us saying hey thanks for giving us a chance to jump on and kind of express our passions a little bit more Absolutely. Yeah, it's a privilege to be here, a privilege to be a part of the newsroom team. And uh, 
it's gonna be such a big year for us. I'm so excited. I know, man. I know. I I cannot wait to see where this goes. Two two full time spring leagues ahead of us. You know, the USFL, of course, being in this one in particular, and so much more on the horizon as well for content coverage and the like. You know, and really, I think a lot of that started today. A lot of that started here today. Uh, before we get into that, though, let's dive into earlier week news. So here's the thing: this week started off. I think, I guess, if you look back. Maybe somewhat of a humbler note, but not really, I think, uh, in terms of the impact of what this means for the specific team. We got a double got a double whammy of sorts in terms of kind of leading in. So Pittsburgh Maulers, they've been busy. They have uh they've had quite the offseason, tons of signings. We got a new general manager in the building, got a new head coach as of late, Ray Horton, son of defensive coordinator Jaron Horton, joining up on this roster and joining up to lead these young men into battle. And I think people were wondering when the, when the USFL had their coaches in for a photo shoot, Horton wasn't on there. Now Fisher and Todd Haley weren't either, but Horton wasn't there either. And so I think people were asking, where's Horton? Where, where, where has he disappeared to? And sure enough, there had been some rumors about a color change. We didn't know how substantial they were. We didn't know if that was actually going to be the case of something happening. And sure enough, come, of course, earlier this week, back on Tuesday, the USFL comes out. out, They had said the night before, 9 a.m. announcement, Eastern time. And they joined the rest of the city of Pittsburgh, the rest of the Yinzer population, as they call it out there. I got to say that, honestly. They joined it. They're black and gold now. (laughs) Well, yeah. I I, I mean, look, if I didn't say it, Ducky's going to come on here in the comments and he is going to tell me that I should have mentioned it at least in some capacity. So long story short, Ducky says goes. So it (laughs) does. It does. That man, that man has his own powers and I cannot, I mean, Hey, you got to even put in a question in Canton, Ohio, which I did bring that up soon. Um, But here's the deal. Here's the deal though. The Mullers black and gold. Now joining the Pittsburgh ecosystem. Um, James, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I wanted to discuss this. I, overall, I'm one of those guys. I have, I like the change overall, but there is a special place in my heart that will miss the purple and orange. Not going to lie. Where are you at? I, 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 I'm with you there. So like, it's funny because the purple and orange jerseys grew on me. Of course, I wasn't around when the original USFL, uh, <laughs> was instated sure. back in the eighties. Um, Nor was I, by the way. So <laughs> I, I had less of a connection to the purple and orange that, you know, an original fan would have had. But I did like the jerseys. They grew on me. I think, funny enough, I think heading into the heading into the season uh, in year one, I had put out an article ranking just, of course, my own subjective opinion uh, on the uniforms. And I had Pittsburgh yeah. at eight. And the reason why P- Pittsburgh was dead last was because I was like, it just doesn't make sense because they're not the city's colors. Like it just would make sense to have black and gold. So Mm -hmm. while I was like, the design looks good, it just doesn't fit Pittsburgh. So I am, I'm happy that they made the change. I think from like a marketing perspective, it just makes so much sense. I mean, I don't know, like, you know, say at some point they play at Heinz field or who knows where they'll play. Right. But say they're playing football there in Pittsburgh, like, having a bunch of purple and orange mixed with, you know, Steelers fans that are there wearing their black and gold. Like, it's just not, it's just Mm -hmm. not going to look good. So like, they're all going to be home fans, but they look like two different teams, you know, like it just, well, yeah, Yeah, it it does. I mean, it's, it doesn't match the ecosystem. And that was something that got brought up a lot last season. As you can see in the promo videos that they had bringing us up, that was something that kept being requested all last year. People kept going, you know, Hey, look, Pittsburgh's got a team, you know, in between, of course, other discussions on the said team, one and nine season and the like doesn't help either. But you talk about some of the uniform changes and they're going, well, wait a minute. Why is why is this not matching the city's colors? You know, again, keep in mind, it's not just the Steelers we're referencing, which, by the way, I'll I'll get into my thoughts on. I was curious about this and it apparently seems fine. But you have the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, the main football team in town. Uh, the Pirates as well. And then you also have the Penguins, all all established franchises, of course. And you also have, of course, the Riverhounds uh, in the MLS that are out there too. They reference that as well. Uh, but that's the thing. It's their colors. 
And so I guess my thing is, I think people are questioning, where does that come from? Well, in 84, when the, when the Maulers originally showed up, they had these colors and actually their colors, it was purple Renaissance red, not orange. That's the official Wikipedia Uh listing, by the way, for the original color scheme is Renaissance orange. Look what you do in your research, Zach. I love it. I'm just saying, look, you some like it's like champagne silver. You know, I I personally would call it gold, but I I was corrected by J, by uh you know Jake you know what J, she so does he goes by of course online one from uh you know the USFL shadow you know Shadowcast as well, so he corrected me on that one back at the time, and you know they chose that back in the eighties, and it was partially partially to deviate you know from the Steelers at the time. Think about this: the USFL back in the eighties was about competing with the NFL. It was at that level. Today's is not right. the same. That that is that has been well established. Right. But nowadays, you know, you come in. Okay, you're not competing with the NFL, so you now you ask yourself, can we use this color palette? I had questions, and I, I want I want to see what you think about this. My main questions were about: Can you do the same color palette while referencing a steel worker with a second team in that city? That was my curiosity. Apparently. They they did their homework. I was not shocked Fox being that way, but that was something I was concerned about going in with this change. If it was the going to the rumored section of it. Yeah, you know, that that's actually a really interesting point, one that I haven't really thought of. Um, I think from a general standpoint, here's the thing is like in another city, that might be a bit of a head scratching move. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. But Pittsburgh, as Ducky likes to call it, it's a city of champions. Um, and they bleed black and gold. Yeah. So I don't think it really matters what the team is. Like, they want to wear black and gold. Like, that is their identity, really. So, yeah, I, I think, of course, Fox did the research. USFL did their research. And I think I think they got it right. I mean, it certainly seems that way. Engagement was through the roof. Uh, the team <laughs> the team gained back already over, over 100, over 100 uh, followers or as it is. So clearly something was working very well, actually. Actually, yeah, I take the, that back. It was over a have... thousand followers. I I under I undershot that. That's the recording right now, by the way. Right. Yeah, they've they've gained at least a thousand. I'd say probably about two thousand by now. I think. Uh, I could yeah. be wrong. Uh, I mean yeah, it's a little about twelve hundred. Yeah, because they I'm one of those stat junkies. I check the Twitter feed ones. By the way, those are Twitter numbers. So if you hear anything like that, that is me. But yeah, they've gained at least 1,200 new followers just from the jersey alone. And credit, they got right. a double whammy. So right, well that and no. sorry to cut you off there. No, no, um, no, no. But like the the engagement, it's not just likes. Like it's people that are quote tweeting it and like sharing. Like wow, I'm so happy the Maulers are black and gold now. And like it's it's you know it's fans, it's people, it's like press as well um i know like there's been some pittsburgh you know different news outlets and whatever they're like hey the pittsburgh maulers they're back black and gold now guys they're they're close now in canton so you got to come out and support so like that's been great to see and i think it's exactly the result the usfl wanted but you see how special that color palette is you know like i said it, it was apparently it was that big of a move to where they said yeah we can run with this and it will be beneficial to us I think in that term. And like I said, I, they, they did their homework and now they're able to be joining up with the Steelers in terms of having that special city scheme that they get to be, I guess, more atoned with the city that they will be, you know, working alongside and marketing towards, you know, is we get longer into the tenure of the USFL. These teams are going out to their cities fully one way or another at some point. So the best way you can assimilate in is one section to me is getting black and gold coloring on your uniforms. The other thing is how are the uniforms going to look, which is I think the next big question to a lot of people is do you keep the same shoulder pad design that they had with the originals? Now I'll give, I'll give Ace from the U S full network credit. He did some excellent mock-ups with this stuff on the fly on Photoshop. Uh, one of them was uh I say one of them was a Madre London concept that looked really dashing. I had a few guys that they did different setups where it was the away jerseys, where it's the white main color, yellow shoulder pads, and maybe a little black accents. Uh, there's one with black numbering with like box letters. 
there's a few combinations. We know the helmet is going to stay pretty much the same. Black helmet with the Mauler's hammer steelworkers throw handle type of logo. Just the same as that, but it's just, it switched up that colors now. I wonder. To I'm gonna I'll I'll let you think about this. To me, I think you should have it black pads for the for the home jerseys. That is black tops, yellow in the center, and then if you wanted to go the opposite way, you just flip where the white accents are on the away jerseys. The white goes back where it is, like the old like the ones from last year, but you stick the black, keeping it bump up top. Right. I think there's a few ways you can go about it, but keep the base pattern. But the colors, that's going to be the choice to me that they'll have to balance the most. I I completely agree with that assessment. And and for one, I love shouting out the USFL Network guys. Yeah, they they had some really nice mock-ups. That oh, yeah. I saw the one, I think, from our buddy Webb uh, with Madre London. I was like, man, that I can't wait to see him out on the field rocking some of that swag. Um, but yeah, I, I think I would like to see them keep the general design because the Maulers are one of the few jerseys in the USFL as of right now that has like a little bit of a different design, you know, with those mm-hmm. shoulder pads, like the, the color accents there. So I think that they should stick to something like that just to switch things up a little bit, right? Um, And hopefully, I mean, we know they're going to get it right. I mean, they've done everything right so far with that. So um, I'm, I'm excited to see what the reveal is going to look like. Yeah, it, it should be stoked because now we'll have uh, two jersey reveals coming up. Remember, showboats are still, that's one. You know, we're still waiting to see. Um, that's going to be probably sooner yeah, part, rather than later now that you think. Part of me was somewhat expecting it to possibly happen during the Canton Hub announcement, but it, it didn't, and uh, I'm sure it's coming soon. Yeah, that that is something I was surprised by. I mean, you have a good opportunity there. Um, I mean, credit, you know, Coach Horton was out with the rest of the coaches out in L.A. doing promo videos as well. So I was kind of wondering if maybe that they would get some photos there too, possibly. Um We will find out. I mean, keep in mind, if we're talking about PR and kind of building up hype for a league, you know, it's good to spread that content out a little bit. So that jersey, you can probably wait a bit if you wanted. Not, I mean, not terribly long, but, you know, the schedule to me, that's something that's going to be more of a focus for people next. And then maybe you wonder about the jerseys after that, depending on when that drops, you know. But the Maulers, I mean, I think to me, they stick with a similar pattern. It, it was I working. Agree. I thought so there were a lot of people that either they they were diehard fans of that pattern. They just maybe didn't like the color. So I think you stick to me. You just I just think you stick with it. I think you do that. I agree. I mean, and and right, and there's nothing wrong with the Maulers uniforms in 2022. The really oh. the purple and orange is not a bad thing by any means. It's just black and gold, of course, as we've already gone over. <laughs> fits yeah. the city like it just makes sense so yeah i i'd say stick with a similar design and, and just go from there that's probably their best bet and at the same time probably their easiest decision too like uh that way they don't have to actually completely redesign it they just got to figure out what, what colors go where yeah i think a lot at that time it becomes more about what fabrics you're buying in terms and dyes that you go into with the fabric you know because if and that i mean for the most part you can keep the same dimensions of every one of the cuts you just have to switch out what your fabric types are in terms of that color palette. So right. in that could be an easier thing where you're not, I won't call it wasting time, but I would say you are not, you're utilizing your time better at that point and keeping something that at least fundamentally the, the concept of the Jersey worked well, you know, the colors will make it pop better now this time than maybe even some people thought in the past this deal. Couldn't have said uh, any better myself. I'm trying my best. Hey, look, <laughs> I ain't perfect. Sometimes I get lucky. This is the time I get lucky, apparently. <laughs> apparently. I, was, I, I, I think do... this time you just had the perfect research, honestly, Zach. I mean, you're doing great. <laughs> well, hey, look, you know, I did. Get an A plus for me right now. I've, I've so keep it solo. up. I don't want to put that grade down. So, I did uh... some hosting here <laughs> and there. You know, I've done, yeah. done a few shows of my time. Just, just saying. Just one or two, maybe. At, just I'd say at mind. least one or two. It's not like I put on my profile. I do too many shows anyway. <laughs> right. I, I, look, I, I I love podcasting, man. Love being on here. Uh, and look, Ray Horton, I think he loves those colors. One quote that he had, or at least he was, you know, I think perfect encapsulation, final thoughts, at least with the Pittsburgh coloring, uh, said, quote, Pittsburgh appropriate. That was uh, one of their. That was one of the Mauler's posts on Twitter on their social media back on Tuesday. Was 
about just his comments. And they, and again, they had withheld his videos, his pictures from that coaching event, or at least that coaching get together. So they just kind of sprung it on. There's like perfect timing type of thing. Cause they had to surprise people. So he's, he's obviously excited him being, of course, a former Pittsburgh head coach himself. Um, Super Bowl championship, right. or not head coach, but in the coaching staff himself uh, for multiple Super Bowl runs. I gotta clarify that. Of course, of course, this is his first head coaching gig, though. Really happy for him. A lot of people are excited to see him. I think in that spot, and he gets that also helps with connecting to the Pittsburgh market. Is somebody like that they get to have absolutely someone that is very familiar as a face, and now those people have a better chance. To go out to games let's transition shall we let's start talking let's do the, it let's do the bigger news the things i think people were waiting on you know the, i think that some news outlets teased others the league teased ahead of time and it was uh it was ready to go and we've been waiting we got half the we had half possibly two-thirds of the hubs that people were talking about they were wondering are we gonna get three we're we gonna get four are we gonna have you know, half the teams and locations this year, what's the whole deal? And some stuff is floating around. Detroit kind of got the most smoke earlier on. I think a lot of people have been sitting on that one for at least a month plus, just yeah. waiting for the league to get its bearings. And then the other one that had kind of got hinted was stuff was talked about Canton. Stuff was talked about Philadelphia. Well, sure enough, Canton gets the crack at it here. As on Wednesday, the league officially announced that Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium will be named as the USFL North Hub. Keep that in mind. They're referencing more as a North Hub in this instance. It it is going to be more of a Pittsburgh Mauler centric stadium, for sure. They are they their PR even was their media advisory by the way was referencing it as being in the greater Pittsburgh area. So clearly there is a skew, as they will be having the Maulers and the Generals at that hub for the season but it is not the same to me in sense of how they are treating it as like birmingham memphis and of course when we talk about detroit this one is definitely more a true hub setup and feel in terms of hey we are closer to pittsburgh we are going to treat pittsburgh like a market but technically we are not directly i would say in that market is how i viewed it right well, it see, it's a very interesting concept, right? Because you might be wondering, and I'm sure some of the viewers here are like, well, why in the world are you going to Canton? They're not rebranding a team, you know, because that was rumored for a time as, oh, there's a Canton hub, so they're going to rebrand the Maulers to the Canton Maulers or the Canton this or the Canton <laughs> that, right? So right. the league is in such an interesting position here because first and foremost, they were not, they weren't 100% sure that they were going to have four hubs uh, for season two. I mean, it was talked about for a while. It was going to be anywhere between two and four. Yeah. So the fact that we got four is a huge blessing, I think, in general, because, of course, the more markets we're in, the better, uh, the better for the league. But they've got to do things incrementally, right, which is, of course, stuff that we know. That's why the USFL had one hub in season one and slowly but surely expanding. And I think the thing here is, and the key part that people need to take into consideration is the relationship with Canton, right? You had your playoffs there in Canton, and the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, they that whole village there, they want the USFL there. They want pro football play there. They don't just want one game during the NFL preseason. They want professional football play there as much as they possibly can. So I'm assuming that, uh, you know, the league... Again, they already had a good relationship there, and they probably got a solid deal to use the stadium. And since it's at least it's not like super far away from Pittsburgh, it's about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, depending on where you're at in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a place where they can reach out to Mahler's fans. They can probably bring some of them over, and it's it just continues to build a relationship with the USFL and pro football being played in Ohio, in Canton, yeah. Ohio. Well, yeah, Canton, Ohio, northeast Northeast Ohio. You know, and again, they re they reference it. You know, like I said, the media advisory references is Greater Pittsburgh, and again, it it it's not far. Um, I mean, in terms of trying to go out to a stadium, there are commutes that are like that for some. I know Foxborough, for example, if you're out in New England, uh, if you're going from Boston to Foxborough, Massachusetts, you do have to do a bit of a haul to go out there. So this isn't right. uncommon. Um. You know, it's just that, again, I agree, marketing is going to be crucial a lot 
you know, I mean, it's going to be crucial in all the hubs and all the home cities, but I think in this one, you're especially saying, all right, we are going to have to decide what do we want to do with it? Because the hall of fame village, I think is what's going to be a good selling point for this in terms of, all right, we're in between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Ohio and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you know, you can't market Pittsburgh games in Cleveland because that's, there's a city rivalry for obvious reasons there. You can't just go up there and do that. So what's the best middle ground? And I'm telling you right now, like you just talked, the villa, the hall of fame village is the best way of putting it and making it a vacation destination for the summer. Um, and just for good football, you know, if you wanted to put it out there like that, because look, the, the village, it still is under construction. Some regards, we saw it, you and I last year in July, there's work being done, right. but if, have you visited the, the village web, the, the website lately for the hall of fame village? Have you seen what's on there? They, they put the phases of construction. And I think some of the stuff I glazed over last time I was on there, you know, they're building an indoor water park football themed on site. They're building a hotel, cool that? a shopping center. They already got the turf fields out there. They got they're going to put an they have an indoor facility that was definitely up there when we were there. It's it's supposed it is basically a, vac- a football a football fans vacation away, and it's destination away for any time of the year. Twelve year old me would be going crazy, or actually scratch that twenty one year old me would be going crazy if I was there. <laughs> and the Hall of Fame is already to me the mecca in terms of football fans kind of pilgrimage you know like if you 100%. if you are a fan of the nfl just just an nfl fan alone you, to me and if you love the league and like this this brand of the and this brand that brand of football or if you just love the sport enough you got to go out to the hall of fame at least once in your lifetime you know there is so much history of the game you learn just going there that i, I was happy to be back there for the first time forever last summer and being able to now say okay well i can go here Uh, I can get a ticket to go check out the hall, which is already its own great, mostly pretty much full day experience. You can go in Um, the village will be more developed this coming summer for the most part, not saying everything's going to be done, but more things are being added as we are told Uh, ducky does, you know, he's in that area. So he knows. Um, And then uh, you also get football now. Like you can basically make a weekend out of the entire thing for your family in the summer or spring. Right. And I, I think do. it's something that we could see, too, um, with, of course, the league is already collaborating with the Hall of Fame Village, right? So we yeah. could see something where, you know, buy a ticket to the Hall of Fame and you get a free ticket to the USFL game or a discounted ticket or or vice versa. Like, we'll probably see stuff like that because then it's going to increase people like, oh, I really wanted to go to the Hall of Fame. And guess what? The USFL has a game or maybe two games that weekend. And we get 50% off our tickets, or we might get a free ticket if we buy two or whatever. Like, right? Deals like that, that it's going to get more people to show up and more families. Because, again, first and foremost, the Hall of Fame is a very affordable place to go. Like, it's amazing to me, like, how reasonable the prices are. It's such a great family experience. So you pair that up, you know, football just is such a rich sport. There's so much rich history there. And then you get to watch a game there as well. Professional football being played. Like, that's the ultimate experience, if you ask me. <laughs> well, it is. I'll tell you, um, like, the Hall, the Hall of Fame's relationship with the USFL, it keeps growing. Um, I mean, just the, the playoffs last year, I think you, you have to point pinpoint that as the catalyst instantly going, yeah, we kind of would love to have you back. Um that provides extra business for us that we don't usually get. I mean, keep in mind, Tom Benson stadium does other or more. They, they do other events there at the hall of fame stadium. They do concerts a lot, actually. Um, they do other special, especially ones. Obviously there's been, there's football games. You know, we know, of course the, the kickoff to the NFL season always begins there, you know, for the preseason with the hall of fame game. But beyond that, there are open availabilities. So if you're the hall of fame and, and keep in mind, you're the football hall of fame getting to say you're playing, you get, you got a professional league playing at your venue. Again, it enhances the value for you, but also, like I said, it enhances the league's value too. The USFL can ingrain itself even more in the cultural ecos of football as well. Being at a place like that, somewhere that, you know, you can help preserve the history of the sport and the professional scene of the sport. I mean, they sure they built, they have a section now that, you know, it's dwarfed in comparison to the NFL section, 
or sections and basically the rest of the museum in the Hall of Fame. But it's a start. That relationship gonna grow. is growing. Yeah, that was that was such a cool section to see when we were there. And I think what's exciting for us, too, is that, of course, we went to the championship game. So we had that experience of the Saturday heading to the Hall of Fame and seeing all that amazing stuff there and seeing the USFL uh, exhibit there as well. And then we went to the game the next day and it was incredible. So oh, yeah. I think the atmosphere there, you know, as you said, it's just it's literally a match made in heaven. Like it couldn't get any better. Can't get any better. <laughs> Something I think that helps this hub too. And I think this is, I know folks were talking, well, you don't have a, you have the greater Pittsburgh area that you were advertising or I guess greater Cleveland. You can argue that you have two metros that you're in between. Um, so you are going to be possibly getting neutral site fans, you know, guys that maybe want more football. Um, one thing that helps, I think, in terms of the broadcast element is out of all the stadiums that the USFL has, and it, of course, is the one that doesn't have, say, a true in-market, I would say, directly in-market football stadium, it does have the smallest capacity of the four. So that is a good thing in this sense that if you're a guy that judges the league on watching on television for people sitting in the stands, it's a little less noticeable because you can fill the seats easier with that size. So keep the, totally. that to me, keep that also in mind. And again, for Mahler's games in particular, not too far a drive. So the hope is you can get some of those people from Pennsylvania, hopefully stars fans too. Cause remember, and you and I saw this, a championship game. I was surprised the amount of stars fans that are out there. And I guarantee they'll travel for that Pennsylvania for the Keystone battle. When that comes up next year. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we saw a lot of stars there, and we saw a lot of Philadelphia Stars fans there that had old gear. Yeah. So that was cool. That too. I mean, it, it does help that you are, in terms of both generations of the USFL, the, you know, the most successful team to have existed in that. <laughs> in that you, You're in all four championships at this point. Never has been a USFL championship without the Philadelphia Stars so far. Unreal. Could change next year, but it's to be seen. We'll see. We'll see. A lot on the line for Philadelphia there. <laughs> to be seen. Let's give you a few quotes here on uh, the Canton Hub, of course, uh, and a, a few specific ones here um, that are from the press release. Let's get, for example, Coach Ray Horton. Here's one of his about the Hub. Uh, quote, because I've been a defensive coach for both Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cleveland Browns, I know how passionate football fans are in western Pennsylvania and northeastern Ohio. Again, referencing you are in between basically two of those big metros, two very prominent areas of football passion, as you see. Continuing the quote here, quote, as the USFL works to eventually move the Maulers into Pittsburgh, playing in 2023 in the regular season games in Canton presents an incredible opportunity for fans throughout the region to check us out and see firsthand the high-quality professional football being played in the USFL. My staff and I are working tirelessly to build a championship caliber team, so we're excited about having fans visit the Pro Football Hall of Fame Stadium to have a fun time and hopefully become lifelong Maulers fans. So again, point again, he points out exactly what we're talking. But if you can attract the true football fan, and I think, like I said, th this will this is where you'll see in a, where again, Michael Crawford, who I we have a quote from him in shortly that will read off the uh Hall of Fame Resort and Entertainment Company Chief Executive Officer. His position in this, I think, is going to be big on the marketing side of, hey, we need to make this a vacation destination add-on type of deal. Like, you know, Hall of Fame plus football game equals big weekend of fun. I completely agree. I don't know really what to add to that. I mean, it's... it's... <laughs> Kind of what we already went over. Yeah, hey, I, I just don't want. I don't want to take your airspace. That's why I'm giving you these. <laughs> I'm this sorry. is my guy. <laughs> Look, hey, it's all good. Like I just, I don't want to. I don't want to feel like I'm drowning you out. You oh, know, I'm you're just all giving good, you eh? that sake. Give me that sake. All right, let's uh, let's give you Michael Crawford's quote, quote here. Quote. After the incredible response from football fans during last year's USFL postseason, we're thrilled to expand our partnership by hosting regular season games in 2023. Uh, he then continues, quote, the USFL is a fan first league. So we're creating a fun and affordable entertainment destination here in Canton where football fans can cheer on the Pittsburgh Maulers, New Jersey Generals, and other USFL teams while experiencing a wide variety of programming and activities throughout the Hall of Fame village before and after games. Again, you have multiple things you can do. 
that's going to be key. That that quote right there sells, like we said, that's going to be a key marketing strategy. Uh, I believe it's for 898 Marketing who's doing it from what we saw in the PR, uh, who also was helping, I guess, last year as well in that area. They are going to have to sell that you're coming for basically the ultimate football experience during those weeks is the big right. sell, I think, for that hub. Yeah, and something I think that was interesting in that quote, you know, talking about the USFL being a fan-first league. And how many leagues do we see, not just in football, but just across the board, they're like, oh, we're fan-first, or oh, we're this, or yeah. oh, we're that. And the actions, they don't coincide with the words, right? And I've always been the type of person where actions speak louder than words. So, like, it's very refreshing to see what the USFL does, where they they put their mouth where their words are, right? I mean, they, they just... Whenever they, they talk about fan first, putting the fans first, an example of that is the Maulers thing with changing the jerseys. Yeah. I mean, that's something that the majority of fans wanted to see. So what did they do? They went ahead and they did it. So I think it's exciting to see, especially as the USFL continues in year two, three, four, and five, and so forth, just how they continue to keep the fans involved in what happens with some of these big decisions. I think it's pretty cool. And again, it's it's just awesome to see how the USFL Put the, puts their fans first and they actually actively do it on a daily basis. Absolutely. Uh, and again, really sh- uh, highlights that the Maulers one in particular, for sure. I mean, I can think of, of course, the rule changes from last year to adjust the ball, the ball with the chip, which, you know, again, notorious in the beginning of the season, but they correct, they course corrected. They change things. They listen to players too, you know, stuff that helps improve the game. That's what they're looking to do. Uh, and I think, you know, I think Michael here, pointed out that exact same point now if you want say you're out there in of course northeast ohio um i'm a little bit a ways away myself but still i might go out there but guys like ducky for example who are out there um you want to go to a game well the first matchup between the maulers and generals that is going to be april 23rd which by our accounts by the way if you're keeping track that's going to be week two of the USFL season right now remember the showboats and of course the stallions They've already been referenced to be playing in week one of sorts, at least. It, Memphis, at least, is going to be referenced and playing April 16th. There's going to be a game in Birmingham, 15th. So that is your week one setup. Week two, if you're going by that logic, a week later, that's going to be, you're going to be seeing the Generals and the Maulers playing their first of of two matchups that are going to be at that hub for that season. And then we also got... A little hint at week three, which will lead into, I think, the uh, other one that we were talking about. The one that I think a lot of people were sitting, like, again, many of us were sitting on at this point. Um, And shout out to Tony Paul, the Detroit Free Free Pest. He broke this a while back and essentially put a little bit of an ember in that fire to kind of tell people, hey, Detroit is most likely happening. We just need to let the league kind of work out its kinks and decide where they're going to go. Because as you know, right. James, Reinerson Stadium over at Eastern Michigan was one of those options in Ford Field. And I, I yourself, others in our Discord, which by the way, you should join that Discord, Pro Football Newsroom. Excellent conversations we have every day in terms of just, we talk about all these leagues and we debate all these leagues. I, I, I find it the, I find it, I call it the scholarly destination for football conversation and debate maybe philosophical at times, not always, but a lot of times it is. There, there is awesome stuff going on in there. I mean, you even get a chance to talk to a community legend. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty you amazing. Get, you get a chance to talk to the Mauler's defensive coordinator and assistant head coach himself in there. Right. Just get to talk to just Jaren saying, Horton Jaren, as well. He does pop up from time to time. You might want to pop in just to say hi, especially if you're a fan over there from the Pittsburgh metropolitan area. I I recommend it very much so, and that's going to be in the link in the description. But we talked about in that Discord, you know, there were two rumored destinations. Either you're going to Reinerson or you're going to Ford Field. And I think our debate was, well, okay, which one, and keep in mind, this is the USFL, which one makes more sense in terms of the plan? Financial stability, controlled growth, while maximizing improving the product year over year. And I think some of us were leaning on Reinerson because of the fact that some of the costs might outweigh compared to Ford Field. That's just speculation, by the way. We don't know the numbers or the actual financials behind this deal. We're just guesstimating at that point. But 
They got Ford Field, which means you are in downtown Detroit, which is a massive win because you are at the heart of the city at its crown jewel of a football stadium in that section of the state itself. The only other one that goes beyond it is the big house. And, you know, we weren't going to play the big, big house. We're going to play in Detroit, play at Ford field, which some people, which people have talked. I like Ford field. I visit enough. It's a good venue. And this is a win for the league. This is a win for the Panthers. And it had quite the press event. You, sir, were at that press event. I was at that press event. Um, to touch on really quick, so that was my first time at Ford Field, believe it or not. Really? Um, I, I live in Michigan, but I am not a Detroit Lions fan. Wow, so I just okay. I haven't really had a need to be there. I just haven't gone. Uh, so this was my first time going in there. And uh, I, I really like the fact that they chose Ford Field. And I think, uh, you know, part of it, too, is that you have the dome setting there. So that that helps a lot when it comes to weather, right? I mean, we've seen with with the USFL, Birmingham, it was very, very hot during the summer. And yes. while up north it doesn't get as warm, it's still going to be pretty dang warm during those June-July games. So I think that that probably played a little bit of a factor. I think just in general, it's going to be nice for the, for the players to at least whenever they're there playing, <laughs> they'll hopefully have air conditioning. Um, so that, that'll be nice for them. But I really like the idea of Ford Field because, as you mentioned, it's right there in the heart of Metro Detroit. So what better way to get fans to go to games and just like, hey, this is Ford Field. Like, I mean, everyone knows where Ford Field is. Um, and it's a venue that everybody in Michigan seems to love. So, I mean, I have so many friends that always talk about how they love going down to Ford Field, you know, for the whole day to see a Detroit Lions game, just the atmosphere in there. They always talk about how incredible it is. Even when the Lions went 0-16, and they still had a lot of fans showing up. <laughs> so um, I'm expecting to, there to be great crowds. And another part, too, that uh, which we were talking about in our Discord uh, a little while ago is how you can make Ford Field look really good on TV even if the upper dome isn't filled just because of how the lighting is in the stadium, it's kind of darker. So as long as you're filling in that lower bowl, I mean, it's going to look really good on TV. It's it yeah. kind of reminds me of, of the dome in St. Louis where, you know, those crowds in the XFL in 2020 with the battle Hawks, they looked really good, even though the dome wasn't filled to the top. So I think, you know, we'll see. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan is doing really well, right? Say they're having a winning mm -hmm. season and everything is going well, who knows? They might be able to open up that second dome. I don't want to jump ahead of ourselves here. Just filling the lower bowl would be incredible. Um, so I, I'm excited to see how things go. And, yeah, I, I just think Ford Field is, a, is an excellent location. And it, it'll be interesting to see how how many fans show up, not just for Detroit. But maybe they'll even get some Philly, Philly fans there sometimes too. Yeah, which that adds in. So the Panthers will be hosting the Philadelphia Stars in this one, which is kind of ironic, by the way, first U S fall championship, just keep in mind, 1983 uh, was stars Panthers. By the way, the Panthers had a walk-off touchdown to car from Herbert to Carter to seal that victory over the Philadelphia stars, 24, 22 back in the day. Um, so it's kind of ironic that those two will be housing with each other, which they'll be housing over in uh, Ann Arbor, by the way, keep that in mind. Um, they'll be over there from what our understanding is. Um, and Ford Field, you know, it is, it's from that similar era that the dome's in where less retractable roofs, more straight dome construction. You're just, you're basically going inside, you know, a lot, a lot of modern buildings are a lot more, a lot more tractable roofs are coming out because I think people want that adaptability in their venues. Now, if it's a nice day, you open it up. If it's a, if it's crud outside, well, yeah, we keep the crud outside, you know, for back at the and time, it is crud outside a lot in Michigan. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, back <laughs> at the time, this was like at the end of that kind of stretch, like, like I said, the dome of America, uh, the Alamo dome, by the way, that's another example of this type of structure Ford field. They're all basically closed indoor venues, but you know, Detroit's has been used so long and it's been a well-used venue, uh, to where it's going to be, a, it's going to be a solid place to play. Um, remember, this also is the place that the MAC Championship is hosted every year. Besides, that's not along with, of course, the Detroit Lions playing their home games as well. Um, but it's a good venue. It's right off, like Brush Street is that general area where you have Ford Field, and right across the street you have Tiger Stadium. So, the main fascination will be 
and and I and Jay, Jake uh, Chi Soda as he goes, who you went to that press event with, uh, as well. You know, he brought up a great point that was saying, you know, I wonder how this will be with Tigers games in the area. Now, credit the Tigers aren't good right now, but that will be fascinating for traffic in terms of yeah. managing that for the off occasion that they do play together. Which, by the way, their home game, their first home opener, April thirtieth, aka Week Three of the season is when a Tigers game is being played apparently during the same weekend. So fun times. That'll be a fun, it's, fun first experiment for the league. It's these be something to else. Out. And Hey, if you guys show up to that game, there might be some news members there. We will see. Uh, yeah, we will see. I definitely would like to be up there. I have family in Novi, Michigan. Um, okay. So just again, Metro Detroit suburb. Um, my uncle actually is one of the town manager or like one of the town planner managers for that. So oh, nice. Yeah. I, uh, I am thrilled to get up there just to kind of be like, Hey, let's go watch some football. And honestly, ever since I knew this or had heard about this rumor, um, I've been kind of, when we had visited like for holidays and stuff, I've been telling them like, Hey, this is uh sound like it might be here. You might see a lot more of me. I'll take that five hour trip from Indianapolis more often to go up there. Absolutely. Just being honest. Yeah, um, it, it, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to having spring football back in Michigan. Um, speaking of which, you know, with the live event that we were at, it was a privilege to be there. I'm very appreciative of the USFL for having us newsroom crew there uh, to cover the event. Uh, what really gets me excited is just seeing how the city, you know, it, it's been amazing because every city has really come behind the USFL, right? You know, Birmingham mm -hmm. just got great coverage when the Memphis hub was announced. You know, there was a lot of press there, a lot of people there ready to support it. Same thing in Detroit, which was just amazing to see. Uh, lots of press, a lot of people excited about the league, talking about it. You can feel the buzz. Like, they know there's more football coming in. Um, the mayor uh, the mayor of Detroit, who had given a speech, uh, he was talking about, you know, how the Lions, they ended up having a really good year at, at the end there. I mean, they almost made the playoffs, and fans, they were hungry for more football. So now, right. all of a sudden, here comes the USFL. So that hunger, I think, could really help the 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 Michigan Panthers really get more fans there. And if anyone's loyal to their fan bases, it's Michigan. I mean, no matter <laughs> how bad the teams are, which they are pretty bad pretty often, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I I'm excited to see the, the fans show up. And it, it was just such a great atmosphere there. I'm excited to see how the city comes behind the team and just the relationship with the USFL in Detroit, it's very strong right now so i'm expecting that to really play a role in 2023 for sure i think i think this is a good segue into a quote that daryl had daryl johnston had of course a uh, usfl executive vice president of football operations himself and of course uh st stud dresser extraordinaire as we have another custom to see in, in recent weeks um he had a great quote i think on that type of community building and i'll read off to you here so of course just like memphis they started with we're back again that they've kind of been utilizing and I'll, I won't, I've loved you. I'll have you, I think, cause you had some great, I guess, talks about some of the settlement agreements with the O with the OG ownership that this ties into, I think, cause they've been using the we're back slogan. They used it in Memphis. They used it here in Detroit. And I bet if they had gotten into Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, they would have used it in both those cities as well. Um, if they had gotten the chance, but we'll continue on after that portion uh, Daryl goes, quote, with the help of some great partners, the USFL is making history by announcing that the Michigan Panthers have returned home in 2023 to play at Ford Field. The USFL is proud to be part of the revitalization of downtown Detroit, and we're excited about turning up the Motown music and firing up a fan base for professional spring football in Michigan. Look, that's one thing about Detroit that has been talked about for decades now, and it's something that I think proud Detroit residents, whenever I have whether it's talking with, of course, my uncle who, you know, grew up in South, in literally South Detroit, um, or at least talking to, you know, you know, Stefan and the ref himself, who also grew up in Detroit, by the way, you know, talking about those people, Detroit's been, it's been a long comeback and it's been making its way back. Um, there have been strides in recent years from what I have read, watched and seen, uh, Dan Gilbert, by the way, who my understanding, he was at that event. Um, or at least he was a key piece to getting this done. Uh, he has been a big piece of why Detroit is starting to turn things around downtown and in other areas. So, you know, 
much like I think Birmingham's announcement last year, it's about the same deal. We bring economic impact. We bring a city mm-hmm. that maybe has been given a different light that needs new exposure, that exposure again, you know, and credit the NFL, they get give Detroit as exposure every year, but now you get with maybe how the USFL did it with Birmingham. Now you can show that more locally, more of the community stuff that maybe doesn't always get highlighted on the national NFL broadcasts because now that's a special one of four spots that you are going to be tying into hard when you're promoting and when you're doing these football games. Absolutely. That's a great point you bring up because um, Kurt Menefee, uh, one of the, the lead play-by-play callers uh, for Fox, Fox Sports in general, he hosts uh, NFL on Fox Sundays. Um, he's one of the, of course, as you know, one of the main guys announcing for the mm-hmm. USFL uh, season one, and that'll remain here in season two. Uh, he kind of was the host of this event. So he was up, he went up and spoke first and he announced some of the other people that were speaking and things like that. Um, but one of the points that he made was that, you know, Detroit, down, down Detroit is making a comeback. Like it is, and things are improving, things are looking up. And he said, um, and it made so much sense when he said, it. I was like, you know, he is so right. He's like, the community has really come around the sports. And it's amazing how much of an impact sports has. Uh, and, and then he tied it in with the USFL slogan, which is United by Football. And I just thought that was just such an awesome way to tie everything together. Uh, where the, the USFL comes in, it provides economic growth, the community comes together, and it, it's just a way for, for Detroit and any city that the USFL is in to just make an impact and grow together as a community, which I just think is amazing. Right. Well, that's And like I said, for the, for those that, are st- that have stuck there, it is – and that have made that their home for generations. That is, that is a proud community of folks. You know, anytime I've, anytime you read up, anytime you hear about the revitalization and trying to get Detroit back to where it once was. And it's also a proud sports city. You know, I think that, I think it's kind of lost You know, Yes. The lions, they have had their fair share of being the butt end of jokes, but you people sometimes forget. And maybe just because of that, that, I mean, look, you got the red wings there who've been, you know, one of the original six, one of the most dominant hockey teams in the history of the sport, you know, the Detroit Pistons, you know, you think bad boy era, you think, you know, the underdog (laughs) underdog championship runs from the early two thousands, you know, those are prideful teams that you have the tigers themselves, you know, traditional team out there. And again, right across the street from where the lions are going to be playing. So, you know, this is a proud sports city. They they're dedicated to their fan base and, You know, I think one thing that that showed the last year when the Panthers came back, you know, part of it, yeah, sure, Jeff Fisher's their head coach. You know, that's going to draw some media attention. But the Panthers haven't really been forgotten because, again, last championship team that is a football team in the state of Michigan and a pro setting to win a said championship. So you don't forget about that, you know. Right. I mean, the USFL, like I said, it was at the same level. As, the OG version was at the same level as the NFL back in the day. You don't forget about that. And people were people packed in that packed in uh, it's the Silverdome back in the day for their their conference championship before they headed off to Denver to go and defeat the Philadelphia Stars. That was a big deal back then. And I, and some people, it, and it a lot certainly of people, was. I of course, I don't remember it unfortunately. Oh sure, but, no. I have um, <laughs> but I think, and that's what's so exciting too for the league now, uh, which we can get a little bit into this too, you know, talking about the settlement, right? And, yeah. and all that, that whole lawsuit is behind them. So now they have more freedom to talk about the history of the league and to really tap into the richness of the USFL from the 1980s. You know, people, and, and I, I fall into this too sometimes. We're like, you know, you think the USFL, oh, it was just around for a couple of years back in the 80s, not a big deal. USFL was a big deal back in the 80s. Like, it had big-time investors. It had some of the best players to ever play the game. Um, So I think now that the USFL has more freedom there, it's just it's going to be great to see those relationships, both new and old, coming Mm -hmm. together, right? It's not like this is a brand-new league. Like, they have fans from the 80s that are still there that that are excited to see this league coming back. So that will also play a role. And, you know, someone who might be in their 50s or 60s that are like, oh, I went to a Michigan Panthers game as a kid, and now I can take my kids and my grandkids to a Michigan Panthers game. Like, that's the type of stuff that is just so awesome about this league coming back. And it, again, it's just, there's really nothing else to say other than it's just fantastic for the league and and for the community in general. Absolutely. Well, look, I think, again, you see the evidence, you're talking settlement. You see 
you know, again, the return, you know, there we're back the references to, you know, this brand is revived. And uh, my understanding, you, you got a little clarification on some of the settlement details, I guess, in terms of what they can use, which I think some people have been asking, okay, so what's, what did they agree on? You know, what, what did, what did the original owners say? All right, we can let you do this. We can't do this, you know? Right. So I wish I had all the details. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, but we did get some clarification there where the league is allowed to, you know, reference the old USFL and they can reference, of course, the teams. And now now they have the ability to reference like the players and things that happened. Right. So say and this was an example given to me by Daryl Johnson himself. Um, it was like, say a player has four or five sacks in a game. You know, now the announcers are allowed to say, oh, this is the most sacks since so-and-so had five back in 1984. You know, so now they have the freedom to tap into things like that, to talk about stat lines. Um, so, yeah. You so, yeah, that's a basically that? direct connection then. Like, you're, it almost sounds like right. you're tying in, the, in basically the record books of the two yeah. into one at that point. Or at least right. you're comparing the stats, you know, maybe not you're tying in the record books, but you're at least comparing the stats to where maybe you can assume like, okay, USFL history, right. this happens, you know? Yeah. And another thing that he brought up too, is that like, you know, it's something that they'll have to figure out exactly how to manage because for example, like the USFL seasons back then, they were much longer. Yeah. So you're not going to see someone in a 10 game season break some of the records that were in like an 18 game season in the usfl right it's just it's not going to happen so we'll see it'll be really interesting just to see how all this unfolds um one thing that i that was very interesting and i wish i would have gotten more details on is apparently part of the deal is where they can't really use all the footage or just certain footage from the 1980s usfl so uh that's that was part of the settlement and that's uh yeah that's it is what it is fascinating and and hopefully we'll get some bit more a bit more about that because for those of you that maybe have been following along of course you've watching the nfl playoffs they they have the new promo and one of the bits in there is uh well doug flutie warming up in a general's uniform so you know that is technically old film question is i guess right. where, where does that qualify need to figure that out but hey nice to see ref that was something i think some other people they were like well we want to don't just make this like forgetting about the history and the credit. Some of it was because they were trying to figure out behind the scenes, but now you're seeing, okay, Reggie White's getting talked about. Jim Kelly's getting talked about again, you know, Doug Flutie, of course, who remember he was the one that kind of introduced this whole damn thing back in June of 2021, right. you know, right. and then he kind of had to go disappear off to the side of course for reasons and now he can be back in the spotlight again so you know just right that that well, availability and, see, and i think this is something that's super intriguing for the league where they have the ability now at least to the best of not my knowledge where say during the playoffs or the championship or just in this season in general right like i'd love to see the usfl have more like analysts right and some more yeah. shows going on and and content like that so how cool is it going to be when all of a sudden we see Doug Flutie, you know, during the halftime show, you know, talking about, you know, that stuff that they can do now. So that, that that's going to be interesting and very intriguing to me to see which USFL stars do they bring in from the 80s to now analyze the new USFL. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, you're there's a few options there. You know, like I said, Flutie, if you can fig if he's a if he's available. I think you ask him right off the gate, you know, and that, that comes, and again, that comes to the question, you know, what else maybe you add next year, you know, but you're right. More broadcasting elements could be put into play. Um, but I'm fascinated to see what else they use here, but it's great that they get to use that branding of like, Hey, you know, we, this is the brand you remember now. And you can, you know, for the nostalgic fan, it brings them in for the ones that want to enlighten the others about the past. It brings those guys in too. And for those that I think that were wanting to cherish the USFL's past and is the most important one, I think for me and for others, they can acknowledge it now openly on broadcast and highlight what was good football back in the eighties as well. Keep that in mind. It was good. That was really good football back then. I mean, there were all pro stars, hall of famers in that league in the original right. iteration. So they get to talk about those people now, you know, and that, I think that's, that was important to a lot of people. There was a small sect of folks, I'll admit last year that really had 
were upset about not seeing that they finally, they can finally now be either a sigh of relief or they can kind of scream from the rooftops. Yes. We're acknowledging that that is not a forgotten piece of football history there. I, yeah, I completely agree. And I think, yeah, it's just, it's going to be so intriguing to see what routes they take and the approaches that they use uh, when it comes to, again, just the rich history of what this league was in the eighties and how they're bringing it back in a modern way that still honors what the USFL was in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And again, I mean, if you're like they said, the showboats, they lean into it, the Panthers, that's one I have a high hopes for in terms of response, just from the market response of them being back again. Um, I mean, you talked about just the, the amount of press that came out for the city out there. I mean, that, that I was, I mean, watch the live stream. It, it was looking just like crowd. I mean, I, I had to guess it was, what do you think at least a hundred people there or something like that? It had to have been something like that. I mean, especially with all the USFL people that were there already. Yeah. It, there was a lot of people there. I'll be honest. They even had a couple moments where I was like, Oh my gosh, there's so many people here and your, your heart starts bouncing a little bit. <laughs> It's wild, man. I pre- press events or something else. I'll tell you, I'll tell yeah. you that uh, I got my, get my first taste last year at Canton, you know, getting over those goosebumps. It's a start, but like just being able to talk to people in the same room that are like industry professionals or, you know, they're higher ups like that. Right. That something well, different. yeah. And I, <laughs> they're in the middle of all of it. Um, I was just kind of standing in the, in the room, just kind of looking around and someone, someone stopped me and was like, hey, can I help you with something? And I was like, Oh, I'm good. Just taking it all in. You know, just taking it all, letting it settle in. So, uh, yeah, that's it was great vibes, great vibes. <laughs> and sometimes that's all you can do, you know. Right. That's really all you all you can do. Uh, before before we head out for the, for the evening, I do want to read off because I, I don't want to leave without these quotes here for Detroit, just because we did talk about Daryl's, but I do want to get the local flair here, much like how we were talking with the Hall of Fame Village. So, for example, we'll go. Let's t- let's touch on uh, Mayor Mike Dugan's quote that he left for the press release quote today's announcement that the Michigan Panthers are coming home to play at Ford field builds on Detroit's momentum as a sports and tourism destination. Uh, he continues. This means we now will have five major sports teams all playing downtown. So keep that in mind. They are putting them in with the big boys. Uh, we welcome the Michigan Panthers and USFL fans to our city and look forward to increased foot traffic. These games will generate from our downtown businesses and restaurants, which if you saw anything from Birmingham's financials, which those were revealed last year, it brought money to the city. So they oh, proved absolutely. that the USFL comes to town. You are bringing extra city revenues in, you know, and keep in mind that is the sports district. So getting a little extra cheddar from folks that'll be down in that sector of downtown businesses around there should see a boom in population, not just from Tigers fans, but now you'll get Panthers and possibly just fans wanting to see football down there too, from say stars games there's extra pop possibilities like we were whatever's seeing going on last year. Right. And and that brings up another point too here is like, I think it's just the beauty of the fact that we've made it to a season two. Yes. So now the USFL has this, that foundation of, Hey, look what we did in Birmingham. We went in there and things just went amazing. You know, the economy boomed. So now you have that offer where, you know, of course, whenever uh, any league goes into a city, like, sure, there might be a little bit of growth, or even if it fails, like, there's going to be some people that go to one or two games at least. But with the USFL, like, you had the big boom, you had a whole season, so now you proved yourself, and now you can show these cities that, hey, we're the real deal, we're here to stay. Right, right. I, I, again, builds momentum, you know, and I, I think that, you know, you get through another year, and also, you know, we talk about, say, like, also – uh building, I think, relationships. Look, Canton, to me, that relationship doesn't get built if you don't have that successful playoffs, you know? Uh, so you do well in Detroit. The sky's the limit to me in terms of what you can future-proof and kind of put footholds in in downtown Detroit. So very right. much a vital second year for those regards as well. Uh, Absolutely, especially yeah. with how big of a market Detroit potentially could be. Yeah, I mean, it's a top-10 media market in the U.S. Keep that in mind. I know it's population wise, it it's definitely not the same as it used to be, but it still is one of the big boys in terms of television markets in the US. So they're getting into not only a big TV market, but they should hopefully be getting into an enthusiastic sports market all the same. Remember, 
Yeah, I think when you're talking about Fox, television company as well, TV companies going to be thinking about the other things that maybe not we're always thinking as sports companies do in terms of ad revenues, in terms of bringing eyeballs first, you know, generating what's important to sports revenues, which is the TV dollars first and foremost. So, and remember, Absolutely. they also keep, they keep some of those costs back because they're the TV provider. They don't have to pay somebody for that. Right. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say is like, you know, that's, that's a huge deal for the USFL because obviously they're, you know, own parent company is Fox. So, or Fox mm-hmm. sports. So like, yeah, that plays such a huge part of like, some of the, like some of the I guess schemes and what am I trying to say? Where where they go depends on how well they can do in those markets from a TV yes. standpoint too. It's not just about the fans going to the games. Mm-hmm. One last quote I got here, and this is going to be from uh, President CEO of Visit, CEO of Visit Detroit, Claude Molinari. Uh, He goes, Detroit is a city of champions and visit Detroit and Detroit sports commission are excited to welcome the Michigan Panthers back to the city. He then continues having the USFL in the city will further enhance Detroit's momentum and highlight the incredible cultural vibrancy our region offers visitors and residents like. So again, pretty some similar line along with mayor Dugan there uh, bringing folks in more, more foot traffic, more economic boost to downtown all similar things. Like I said, we talked a lot about Birmingham and how that was a big selling point last time around when they got that first season there and Detroit, as we talk, that fits the mold. That is definitely what they are doing right here. I think Memphis too, if we're being honest as well, you know, and and the fact that Memphis is a market that, you know, historically it's done pretty well with spring football. It just needs one to stick. (laughs) That's the main deal. Right. hundred percent. And like, um, going on Memphis there, like they had the Memphis Express there in the Alliance in 2019, and it didn't do amazing. But you have to remember that the Alliance was just, it was kind of a mess. I mean, just from top to bottom. I mean, we don't need to get into all the details there, but like the marketing wasn't great. It wasn't really advertised well. Uh, I don't, I highly doubt the infrastructure was nearly as solid as it is with the USFL. So I think that's like, of course, you know, a big part of it. And that's why, I love how Daryl Johnson and Eric Shanks and everyone else at Fox Sports, they take such a a very smart approach with their strategies here of just building from the ground up and making sure they don't get ahead of themselves. And Eric Shanks is someone that we need to talk about too, you know, the CEO yeah. of Fox Sports. I mean, he plays a big role there. He was, of course, at the event uh, yesterday in Canton and today in Detroit. And uh, it's great to see his backing of the league as well like he sees like he sees the vision and that's super important to have the ceo of your parent company seeing the vision just the way the league does so like uh, that's awesome to see yeah he's very he's a very very ambitious leader of that arm of fox corp itself so um someone that definitely i think as we've seen as we've uh witnessed in person both you and i as well i mean you you met him there of course or you met with him there of course but i mean we've I've met, we've met all three at one point have kind of run paths past him too. And very much has a vision for this. And it's, uh, you know, they're doing it their way, growing their way, and they're going to keep building their way so far so good. And now all the cities are set. I do want to end on this little talk with you though. How long do you think it is until the schedule drops? All the cities are there. They have three of the opening game weeks set up in terms of where the hubs get their first games for, you know, hosting can't be too long from now. You think? No, it should be. I would hope sometime in February. Um, I think that'd be pretty reasonable. Uh, it gives fans plenty of time to, uh, to get to, to get their tickets and the big plans. Um, <laughs> I think it would be very interesting because we've seen the USFL go head to head with the XFL. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes here and there. So don't be surprised if it comes right around the time the XFL kickoff. Like I would not, I would not be surprised if it happened. Then it could, it might not. But uh, we've seen them do. I mean, with the whole Memphis announcement that came, you know, with the, I forget exactly what the XFL was doing, but something big was going on. Like it was two back to back big things. So uh, that was oh my goodness. I am sp- I'm trying to remember that. Um. Shoot. Was, it was that the uniform reveal? Or I was one of them. <laughs> one of the things that the XFL did. No, I don't think it was. But uh, 
Um, I'm space. I'm spacing right now. I know. I, my mind is way too focused on the USFL to even be. <laughs> we have this is the thing with spring football, man. We just have so many leagues that we're trying to keep track of. It's like <laughs> it's hard to keep. It's hard. It's hard to keep track of it all. I know so much football right now, twenty four seven. I know, or at least sorry, twenty four seven three at least three sixty five every week. You're gonna get a football game starting from the Super Bowl this year onward into next NFL season. If depending on what you watch, whether it's you know ours, the XFL, ELF, CFL, you can watch a football game every weekend starting February starting February eleventh. And you'll get football all the way up until through next season into next February. That, that that's the world we live football in. Football fans' dream. <laughs> that's the world we live in now. That is how the sport has grown it's, that much. You know, for the love of football, for the love of football, man. <laughs> united by football. Yes, yes. That's the new talking. the new slogan: United yes. by football. We're united by football, especially here. <laughs> but it, it's so true because I mean, without these the spring leagues and without this stuff going on i mean you and i wouldn't have connected and become good friends right. and companions throughout this whole journey so uh thank you usfl for continuing to unite us all with football uh, i i think that's the best i think that is the best way to to end this and i also think that is a great great way of saying that we've made a lot of good friends along the way in the several years again this is five year anniversary of not a pro football newsroom it's four year anniversary this is also a weird one four years since the aaf which is as much as its collapse kind of was a sad mark on the spring setting, it is kind of, to me, considered the beginnings of what is where we're at now. So it does get a consolation prize for saying, hey, this idea maybe has some legs if we're smart enough and the crowd's growing again for it. Yeah, I mean, I can always thank the Alliance for teaching me that spring football has a lot of heartbreak involved. Well, that too. <laughs> I, I I did have to think about some things after after week seven. <laughs> that that was a sad time, but we're here now. We're here. It's in the we're in the in the we're in the modern day. The present's yes. good. The future's looking great. That's what matters right now. We can Absolutely. think the past, but the present it does it didn't even happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. It's gone. It's out of my sight. Charlie Ebersole, who is that? Tom Dundon? Charlie, Never Charlie heard Ebersole. the name. Bill Pulling, wait a minute. No, um, uh, Bill's Bill's with us. Uh, he because remember he's with the coaching co committee <laughs> with that selection process. Although, hey, hey, look, he got some good ones. It looks like in terms of Ray Horton and John D. Filippo. So I can't complain. They're good. They're good replacements for the guys coming out, coming out that are coming out of there. For for example, Larry Fedora and of course Coach Kirby Wilson. And, and just a quick side note about Horton. He is a private pilot. If you guys didn't know that, now you do. I didn't know that actually. Uh I'm that's a fun fact from my day. I'm taking that with me. Really? You you didn't yeah. know that? No, I didn't. Oh. I I was not aware. Well, well, that's funny because uh another advertisement for our Discord here. Um, Ducky and Jaron Horton were having a conversation about that the other day. That so. is on me because I I clearly missed that conversation. <laughs> in that yeah, Discord. the plan was for the plan was for Ducky to ask uh ask Ray Horton a question about his private piloting originally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good times good times that good stuff and that's what you get in the discord by by the way just keep that in mind um guys thanks for tuning into the episode 44 of the usfl podcast and again if you want to join that discord by the way links in the description we have a blast in there it's not just usfl stuff guys we talk basically all the alt leagues you want to debate discuss and just kind of talk about the latest comings and goings it's one of the, it's arguably the best to me the best server you can find out there to get all of your spring and all football destinations all in one in a really good community. James and I are on there too, along with the ref, along with Jaron Horton, along with Ducky, the community legend himself, and many, many more people that you can have a good time chatting up about spring and alternative football leagues or the NFL. We have NFL conversations too. It's on we there. Have it all. Well for you. We have it all. Everything. It's everything. <laughs> It's like it's like the weird out song UHF. We've got it all out there. Yes. I love that song. I love that song. Uh, really good movie. Uh also, guys, by the way, again, follow us at USFL Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and maybe that TikTok. I swear we're gonna do that TikTok. I know this is like becoming a joke, a running joke at this point. We are going to do it. I just need to get a video out there. That is just me 
getting it out there. Um, also, you know, if you're listening on to our podcast edition, you want to check out the video. Maybe you are curious what this thing looks like here. Head on over to YouTube, look up at USFL podcast. And where's the rest? Go over there, check the video, click that big red button below our video, and then click that bell. It builds morale, makes you feel good, makes us feel really good too. Pumps up the show. We're having a good time. You guys get to keep up with all the latest from the USFL podcast, as well as our amazing crew here with USFL Newsroom as well. And hey, we hit 5,000 subscribers. You get a custom USFL jersey from the shop. Thanks to us. And we'll give that right over to you. You guys better hit that subscribe button after hearing that. I'm just saying. Look. And in in the honor of the ref, you have to do the hand motions here (laughs) just to... You're I just had qu- to bring it out. Just- I'm glad you're filling the quota because someone's got to do it. And clearly, clearly, I'm focused on pointing it at the camera, making sure to just tell people. So I got to have that guy on the side. Thank you for yes. being my wingman today, James. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me on, Zach. This was a this was a pleasure. Until next time, guys. Catch you on the flip side for more USFL coverage. We'll catch you in episode 45 or in a future interview, which we got some coming up. So stay tuned for those too. Until next time, everybody.